Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, let us discuss about one of the important cranial nerve involvement that is Bell's palsy. We know that facial palsy can be uh, from uh, cortex, from brain stem to brain stem, then external peripheral nerve. Cortex, it can be involved as a part of hemiparesis. You can get facial nerve palsy on the same side of weakness. On but on the uh, the lesion may be on the opposite side right side cortic cortical lesion can have uh, left sided right sided cortical lesion can have left sided weakness with left left sided facial involvement brain stem that is pontine lesion pontine lesion can have same side facial weakness suppose there is a left sided pontine lesion left sided whole face will be involved like that even peripheral nerves also can be involved. That is one of the peripheral nerve lesion is called as Bell's palsy. So the facial nerve originated from the, uh, you can see here from the pons, nucleus is in the pons and it gets bilateral innervation, both sides innervation is there. Then the peripheral root, it go to the face. Okay, so that is a pathway of uh, facial nerve so a cortical lesion can have facial nerve palsy on the opposite side a pontine lesion can have lesion on the same side and a peripheral nerve apparatus this is the peripheral nerve apparatus okay if there is a problem here you can have same side facial weakness so this is element type of weakness, lower motor neuron type of weakness. This is element type of weakness, but this is UMN type of facial weakness. We will see the differences between each type of facial nerve palsy. Now we have already discussed that cranial nerve nucleus, seventh cranial nerve nucleus that has got some uh, sundays like motor nucleus is in the pons. From there motor fibers originates. Superior salivary nucleus is same in pons, parasympathetic content to nerve of uh, uh, intermediates. Nucleus of uh, solitary tractus, it is in medulla, receives sensory component from the nerve of uh, intermediates. We will see all these things afterwards when we examine. Before leaving the brainstem, that wind around the sixth cranial nerve so you can see here it winds around the sixth cranial nerve this is a sixth cranial nerve so this facial nerve uh, go like this and nerves intermediate is here facial nerve nucleus and tractus solitaris superior salivary nucleus all these things these things together we call it as facial nerve nucleus Now another nerve that is cauda tympani nerve, that is a part of facial nerve nucleus, you can, facial nerve you can see here, it contains both parasympathetic efferent and visceral efferent fibers. Parasympathetic fibers are responsible for, for salivation, visceral efferent fibers convey sensation from the taste from the anterior two thirds of the tongue. So they also stimulate the secretion here you can see and it carries the sensation taste sensation to brain. So these are the functions of 7th uh, cranial nerve. But when there is a uh, UMN type of lesion, all these apparatus may not be involved. But whereas in an LMN lesion, especially in the peripheral LMN lesion, all these fibers can be involved. So there is importance of knowing the anatomy of facial nerve. Now motor examination is, we have already seen that uh, which are muscles supplied by uh, cranial nerve 7. So motor examination is very important. So facial asymmetry is very important. If uh, uh, one side is weak, the face will be deviated to opposite side because opposite side muscles are very powerful. So if uh, weakness is on the, uh, weakness is on this side, the face will be completely deviated to opposite side. So you can see it very clearly by seeing the mouth. So mouth will be deviated to opposite side. 
Look for involuntary movements over the face. That is mainly seen in element type of lesion. You can see fasciculation, twitching, all these things. Narrow nasal muscles or na narrow nostrils can be seen because of uh, a nasal muscle weakness. Ask the patient to raise eyebrows so you can see the wrinkles on the forehead normally. This is uh, by occipitofrontalis muscle. Ask the patient to close the eyes against your resistance. So patient will not will be able to close properly now, but you are unable to open it with force. The examiner is unable to open with force. That uh, tells the orbicularis oculi muscle is normal. To show the teeth or smile, that is uh, controlled by or supported by levator angularis and rhizorius. If uh, it is deviated to one side, opposite side muscle is weak. Blow the cheeks. So that is done by vaccinator muscle. So these are the tests we will see afterwards. First slip or whistling. That is by orbicularis oris. Orbicularis oris. Here we have learned orbicularis oculi. Pull down the corners of mouth and wrinkle up the skin like this. So you can see the neck uh, muscles very prominent this is platysma muscle now you can see blow the cheeks while examiner is pressing the cheek blow the cheeks fill the air here we ask the patient to fill the air in so it will be blowed up then you try to press it it will be difficult to press in a normal uh, uh, facial nerve uh, person with normal facial nerve but it will be very easy to press if the face is where a vaccinator muscle is weak. Now to show the teeth, levator angularis and rhizorius, if this is normal, so uh, your lips are normal now, if the lips are deviated to one side, then this side is weak, this side is normal because normal muscles pull towards that side, this side is weak, so the deviation will be towards the normal side. Now ask the patient to look upwards, so you can see the wrinkles here, so you can see the wrinkles here, so you can see the wrinkles here. Suppose, suppose there is facial nerve weakness on one side, so this side wrinkles will be there, so where there is normal side wrinkles will be there, abnormal sides there is no wrinkling, so that is very important, wrinkling will be absent if there is a uh, element type of weakness because element type of weakness whole face is involved whereas in UMN type of weakness only lower part of the face will be involved upper part will be relatively spared so this is uh, frontalis muscle close the eyes against resistance that is orbicularis oculi so this patient is trying to close his eyes the examiner trying to open the eyelids but since he is having powerful Orbicularis oculi, he is able to close. But suppose the patient is having a weak facial nerve, then it will be very easy to lift up the muscles or he will not be able to close at all. So that is orbicularis oculi. Now these are the basic tests and other important tests is platysma. We have already seen. Ask the patient to do like this so that he can see the neck muscles will become very prominent. Neck fascia will be very very prominent. So that has to be tested, platysma muscle. Now other testing, you have to test for anterior two-third of the tongue. So you can test sweet, sour, salt and bitter by all these solutions. But uh, remember, it will be a very difficult test in emergency room. So you have to ask the patient to uh, show the tongue, pull out the tongue with a cotton, uh, uh, press the tongue with a cotton. Uh, then slowly put one one solution. Uh, patient has to tell whether it is sweet, sour, salt or bitter. Each time patient has to wash his uh, mouth and uh, he should not talk, ideally he should not talk, he should touch and tell whether it is sweet, sour or uh, salt or bitter. So it is a very difficult test. However, when the patient tells he is not able to identify the taste, then that part of the cranial nerve is involved and it is two third of the tongue. And another important reflex that is tested by, you can see here, corneal reflex. You ask the patient to look on the opposite side. Patient should never see you are touching the eye and touch the eye. So normally what you are seeing is the blink response. Patient will try to blink both eyes.
so that is uh, that is corneal reflex it is uh, uh, sensory uh, nerves uh, su supply is by trigeminal nerve and motor is by by seventh plane nerve so when you touch here if uh, this part is uh, both sides suppose when you touch here if uh, fifth cranial nerve is normal then both sides may blink suppose this side fifth cranial nerve is this side fifth cranial nerve is uh, abnormal when you touch it the sensation will not go so both sides will not blink suppose this side facial nerve palsy is there and you are touching on this side this side you are touching the sensation will go to brain uh, like uh, your uh, brain and this side will bring but this side since there is facial nerve palsy that will not blink so that is very important okay so corneal reflex can be tested secretory function you can go for shimmer test it gives quantitative uh, evaluation of tear production so shimmer test can be then normally it is done in ophthalmology department but clinically in your clinical practice you can easily do it uh, uh, with paper now bell's palsy now we are going to discuss about bell's palsy one of the most common type of lmn facial palsy is bell's palsy you know what is the uh, major uh, organism which produces bell's palsy that is uh, herpes simplex virus hsv1 so normally we learn that it is an idiopathic disease but it is not like that uh, most of the cases of uh, bell's palsy is due to hsv1 but there are so many other causes also so many other viruses so many other diseases also can produce bell's palsy bell's palsy is nothing but a element type of facial palsy it is mostly produced by hsv1 okay previously it was known as an idiopathic element type of weakness so here element type of weakness is there that's why you see here the patient's face you can see eyes eyes nose and mouth in human type of facial palsy so what is the difference between a human type of facial palsy and element type of facial palsy element type of facial palsy her whole face is involved whereas in human type of facial palsy only lower part of the face is involved upper part is relatively spared because it has got a bilateral innervation so that's why it is like that but both these cranial nerves are come both these innervations are coming through the same facial nerve in element type of lesion since it, both are coming through that same area the whole face is involved so that is very very important so it's a element type of weakness and you can see that taste fibers also involved so loss of taste will be there hyperacusis and diminished salivation and tear production because all these things are due to uh, the peripheral apparatus of nerve is involved so that's why we learned the uh, anatomy of the facial nerve previously now clinical features one side of the face is completely involved and it progresses very fast within uh, uh, one or two days it will become a complete weakness most of the patients can have mild pain over the face and some itching sensation can be there and excess lacrimation can be there uh, afterwards not initially uh, that we will see afterwards hyperacusis stapedius dysfunction around 33 percent can be there sensory loss is not a feature of uh, facial nerve palsy because fifth cranial nerve is intact here only seventh cranial nerve is involved taste initially taste may not be a big problem but some patients can have this uh, loss of taste sensation on one side but opposite side is there that's why patient may not notice it if you examine it some patients can have this uh, loss of taste but most of the patients will never complain because the opposite side is normal no other neurological abnormalities are there that is very important because it is this is a problem in the peripheral nerve apparatus not in the central nerve apparatus not in the pons so there is no other neurological abnormalities can be there in bell's palsy but but uh, if the element facial palsy is due to some other disease like patient can have uh, multiple sclerosis sle some vasculitis all these things multiple areas of brain can be involved in that case it can be there but in a normal bell's palsy this is not the feature there is no other neurological abnormalities can be there now if the patient is having 
pain around the ear then it can be ramsay hunt syndrome this is due to herpes zoster oticus this patient can have peripheral lesions on the uh, ear pinna or on the face around the fifth cranial nerve uh, uh, first division of fifth cranial nerve you can get some skin lesions so this is called as ramsay hunt syndrome now this is typical feature of uh, uh, bell's palsy we are talking about lmn type of facial weakness so you can see here you can see here this side is completely normal this side facial nerve is involved so all fibers are coming through this tesh fibers uh, bilateral innervation of upper part everything coming through the same route and from there uh, di different divisions go so the upper part is involved whereas in umn type of weakness upper part is relatively spared and when the patient is trying to close his eyes this is a normal area you can see here eyes are closed properly but when we close our eyes you can you can normally you can see that when you are closing your eyes your eyeballs go upwards that's a normal phenomenon here patient is unable to close his eyes so you see the eyeballs going upwards okay the problem here is patient is unable to close his eyes but the uh, upward movement of the eyes are actually normal but you are seeing it when you are examining you are seeing it this is this phenomenon is called as uh, bell's phenomenon don't confuse with uh, bell's phenomenon to bell's palsy bell's palsy is a lmn type of weakness bell's phenomenon is a phenomenon which is seen in uh, 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 lmn type of facial palsy any type of lmn facial palsy you can see this patient is unable to close the upper eyelids and you are seeing the uprolling of the eyeballs that's all that is bell's phenomenon and asymmetry of the face and face will be slightly if the if you ask the patient to smile face will be slightly deviated to the opposite side that is a normal side so that is because these muscles are powerful these muscles are powerless so this a, the whole face will be dragged towards a powerful area so you can see here this eyes are normal so facial weakness this patient is unable to close his eyes so when you try to close the eyes you can see the uprolling of the eyeballs so eye, uh, eyeballs move upwards now you can see here patient is unable to close the eyes and you can see here wrinkles are normal here on the normal side wrinkles are absent here so that is very important finding wrinkles are absent so upper part of the face is involved the uh, eyeballs are rolls up rolling upwards you are seeing that that is bell's phenomenon and face is deviated when you ask the patient to smile or uh, uh, give some pressure you can see the mouth is deviated to opposite side that means towards the normal side so that is a typical finding of bell's palsy now we should know what is the basic difference between lmn facial palsy and umn facial palsy lmn facial palsy means we have seen that it is in the pons so the nucleus of the facial nerve is in the pons from there the uh, cranial nerve comes out from the pons to the peripheral nerve apparatus element type of lesion so umn means this facial nerve nucleus in the pons has got bilateral control in the cortex so one side uh, of the uh, facial nerve will be controlled by suppose right side facial nerve nucleus will be controlled by left side cortex and right side cortex so this bilateral innervation are there for the upper part of the face but lower part of the face only unilateral innervation is there so umn type of facial palsy mainly seen in patients who is having stroke only lower part of the face is involved upper part is relatively spared because 50% of the fibers are coming from the opposite side 50% of the fibers coming same side so any side there is a lesion 50% of the fibers will be lost that's why it is relatively spread so in a severe type of weakness even upper part can be involved but a normal patient who is having a stroke right sided hemiparesis right sided facial nerve can be involved but that facial involvement will be the lower part of the face so that is relative sparing of the upper part because of bilateral innervation no bells phenomenon or weakness of the eye closure so upper part of the face is relatively spared so when the patient is trying to close the eyes that is not affected in umn type of weakness and patient can have cranial nerve palsy on 
uh, suppose it's on the right side same side patient should have weakness that is very important because a human type of lesion in the cortex will have opposite side weakness with opposite side facial nerve palsy but whereas in uh, element type of facial palsy element type itself there are two types one is in the facial nerve nucleus in the pons and the peripheral nerve apparatus like bell's palsy see in bell's palsy there are no uh, other cranial nerves there are no other cranial nerves or uh, there are no other part of cns will be involved so whole face is involved that we have already seen upper part and lower part is involved because these fibers peripheral apparatus contains both upper part fibers and lower part fibers upper part itself both from right and left is there so all these fibers are blocked that's why both upper part and lower part will be involved bell's phenomenon is very classical for element type of weakness because eyes are uh, affected the patient is unable to close the eyes so you can see the uprolling of the eyeballs seventh cranial involvement on the side of the lesion uh, of hemiplegia because if there is a pontine lesion one side patient can have cranial nerve weakness opposite side patient can have uh, uh, body weakness this is called as crossed hemiplegia so at the side of lesion uh, facial nerve weakness can be there opposite side patient can have weakness along with seventh cranial nerve sometimes patient can have sixth or eighth cranial nerve involvement also so that is very important now this is a typical finding you get in human type of weakness and element type of weakness human type of weakness upper part will be relatively spared so you should remember that human type of weakness upper part will be relatively spared and the lesion is in the opposite side and element type of weakness the lesion is on the same side or same side nerve or same side nucleus in the brain stem and the whole face is involved so there is a major difference and bell's phenomenon is classically seen now what is the management of uh, bell's palsy we know that it's a viral infection herpes simplex virus so we have to give a cyclovir 400 to 800 mg uh, 400 mg or 800 mg to 800 mg for 10 days we should give that's a antiviral drug to relieve the edema in the uh, nerve because it's uh, the edema you can see that this, this is the peripheral nerve apparatus and this is your nerve that is inflamed and if you give steroids the inflammation will come down the nerve will become uh, uh, smaller the here it is larger if you don't give steroids then it, the nerve will become larger inflammation will increase and this nerve will be compressed inside the chamber and it may uh, die or it may get damaged so if you don't give steroids there is a high chance of delayed recovery in uh, Uh, bell's palsy then eye protection is very important because patient is unable to close his eyes you have to protect the eyes otherwise this patient can have exposure of keratitis so uh, eye protection is very important and uh, next one is physiotherapy you ask the patient to do regular physical exercise uh, for facial nerve alone so that has to be done then facial nerve stimulation electrical stimulation of facial nerve should be done so these are the basic steps to, to be done in uh patient suicide bell's palsy so drugs are very important physiotherapy is more important than that because many patients may not come to hospital initially they will lose the initial golden hours they will lose that uh, initial period then uh, only physiotherapy and electrical stimulation may be helpful now prognosis most of the patients recover completely uh, 71% full recovery only 12% uh, patients have moderate uh, recovery and for patients can have poor recovery mostly because of the delayed uh, get, delay in getting treatment so after 3 weeks patient start recovering from the illness some patients immediately within uh, one week itself they recover completely and uh, later complication can be spasms contracture tinnitus hearing loss and crocodile tear can be there in some patients because when they see food that is because of the altered innervation of uh, nerves for the Uh, glands so when they see food they uh, they uh, they develop uh, uh, they cry so we have uh, discussed about uh, one of the important facial nerve lesion that is uh, bell's palsy it's a element type of uh, lesion element type of lesion means whole face will be involved both upper part and lower part will be involved 
and when the patient try to close the eyes you can see the bell's phenomenon uprolling of eyelid that's a very classical finding this is due to hsv herpes simplex virus 1 so that require treatment treatment is acyclovir so acyclovir 400 to 800 milligram uh, can be started then steroids are important part of treatment again physiotherapy nerve stimulation all these things are also important most of the patient recover without any major feature these type of patients may not require any MRI, but if you have associated cranial nerve involvement or associated uh, uh, involvement of any, any part of neuron, then you may have to take an MRI. Otherwise, normally, uh, element type of facial palsy, uh, diagnosed as uh, clinically diagnosed as uh, Bell's palsy, does not require any major investigations like uh, MRI brain or CT. Thank you. <laughs>